Hello and welcome to the AFC Court and International Arbitration Centre webinar series 2020, New Opportunities During and Post COVID-19. Today we have webinar 14 in our 2020 webinar series. The topic is Dispute Resolution Practice in Challenging Times, Part 1, A Law Firm's Perspective. Today's webinar will be moderated by Ms. Sofia Zilkadarova, who is a member of our Court and Arbitration Centre Users Committee and is the managing partner at Signum Law Firm in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Uh, this webinar, unusually for us, will be an interactive discussion with contributions from private practice lawyers from Kazakhstan, the Ukraine, Russia and Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, Sophia will introduce our speakers in a moment. Our webinar today is intended to provide an insight into the dispute resolution practice and needs of lawyers and their clients from Kazakhstan and former CIS countries. This is particularly timely and relevant to the work of the AFC Court and our arbitration centre, as we are already attracting casework at the IAC from parties based in some of these countries. And we expect this to increase and for there to also be cases involving such nationalities at our AIFC court. As usual, we have one hour for today's webinar. Uh, please type your questions in the Q&A option shown at the bottom or top of your screens. And the panelists moderated by Sophia will answer your questions at the end of their presentations and discussion. Very quick update, if I may, Sophia, um, on the Court and Arbitration Centre. Uh, we continue to operate our services online 100% without any disruption to the business. This is using our e-filing, e-justice system and video hearings. So far we've had 90 cases across the Court and Arbitration Centre comprising judgments and orders, arbitration and mediation awards. All of our services continue to be provided absolutely free of charge. Uh, this is in addition to our 2020 webinars programme, which as I said earlier includes 20 webinars from our most distinguished common law judges, arbitrators and leading lawyers from Kazakhstan and the CIS region. Um, I'd like to simply ask you all to please be fully informed that from the 30th of June to the 33rd of July this year, our Court and Arbitration Centre will contribute three webinars from our 2020 webinars programme as a part of the online Astana Finance Days. And this will be with participation from our Chief Justice, Lord Mance, and our Arbitration Centre Chairman, Ms Barbara Doman QC, Information and registration details for these webinars can be found at our Court and Arbitration Centre websites and from the Astana Finance Days website. Uh, there has been and will continue to be various related promotions. I now hand over to Sophia and hope you all enjoy today's webinar. Sophia. Thank you very much, Chris, for your kind introduction and special thanks to AFC Court and Arbitration Centre for hosting us today. Um, let me also welcome all the speakers today and participants and I hope you are all staying safe and healthy these days and wishing you strong health and enjoy your summer as much as you can. Before we proceed further, I would like to briefly announce the rules of our webinar for its better quality and efficiency. I would kindly ask you to mute your devices so we don't have um, disturbance during the webinar. Uh, second, on the structure of the webinar, we will have several points to cover during this webinar and we would prefer if Q&A uh, section will be held in the end. So please, you are more than welcome to type all your questions in the chat or Q&A part of this webinar. Also, this webinar is being recorded, so the recording will be placed uh, in future in the on the website of AFC Court and Arbitration. So let's start our webinar. And I would like to start brief introduction of our speakers. And I placed countries, I think, in our alphabetical order to be politically correct. So let me start from Azerbaijan. Ilgar Mehti is a founder and director of Equita Consulting Firm. Ilgar has impressive experience of working on high profile Azeri international projects as well as having the ex extensive experience in working in law in international law firms there so next myself i'm sofia Zolkaidarova, managing partner of signal law firms i spent like more than 20 plus years of my experience supporting businesses of investors in kazakhstan so next picture speaker would be vladislav zabrodin uh, he represents Russia today. He's founder and managing partner of CLS. Vladislav is one of the most notable practitioners uh, in Russia in corporate commercial law, M&A, uh, project finance and public uh, private partnership. 
and Ukraine today, I'm not sure if Yelena already is with us. Uh, Yelena Sukmanova, she is head of litigation of uh, Sayenka Karenko law firm. Uh, Yelena is deeply specialized in dispute resolution in Ukraine. And she's notably been working not only for the businesses, but also she's been first deputy uh, to the Minister of Justice in Ukraine. So these are our great speakers. Welcome everyone. Nice to see you today. So I'm now jumping to the content of our webinar. Today we will try to deliver the news from the neighboring countries and we'll talk uh, briefly about the state of dispute resolution in the country and law firms dispute resolution practices and how they were operating during these challenging times. Uh, then we will switch to what are the main trends and recent developments in litigation and arbitration in our countries and how clients choose the litigation and arbitration venues nowadays if behavior has been changed or uh, decision make, making process was uh, impacted by something. So um, you see the subjects are very wide and we may spend, spend hours and hours discussing these topics. Uh, but what we will try to do, we will be very sharp. We will, we will be very high profile to give you the general understanding of where countries are. And for the specific advice, you could always um, uh, apply and contact my colleagues in the panel today. So let's start from Ilgar from Azerbaijan on sharing his news on how dispute resolution uh, was doing at COVID time. Ilgar, please, floor is yours. And oh, adopting the terminology to the electronic format, we shall say screen is yours. Ilgar, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Sophia. I was trying to admit myself, but apparently was blocked by the administrator. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so what's happening during the um, lockdown season in Azerbaijan? Basically, as I see from the screen, um, similar experiences were um, facing the involved neighboring countries, more or less. Uh, we had uh, basically, um, we are going through the second phase of, of uh, COVID lockdown at the moment, effective yesterday. We have severe restrictions on any activities including, uh, of course, uh, litigation in courts. The only exception is the so-called urgent cases. And by urgent, the law defines things like um, criminal detention when it comes to criminal cases. Uh, in commercial cases, you may still file for uh, some urgent uh, interim measures, um, very you know, urgent injunctions or what have you. But other than that, the activities are postponed, so all cases are put on the table. And we had this situation uh, starting from end of March till around mid-May. Uh, that was the first phase of the lockdown. Then things uh, went back to normal. They actually never went back to normal, as you could imagine. You know, you could still, you should still wear a mask. You should still follow personal hygiene rules. But more or less, um, you could attend the, the hearing. Uh, and now, as I mentioned, we're back into the lockdown um, environment again. The only difference is that uh, cases in Supreme Court are now fully allowed because after the first phase of lockdown, the, the, the Supreme Court administration managed to uh, implement some strict control rules to basically you know, block the hygiene risk. Uh, to the extent possible, allow people to enter one by one, you know, to, you know, check for, import the mask regime all the time. So more or less, the Supreme Court is, is uh, functional, operational. Uh, other courts are, uh, cases are still on hold. Uh, except for urgent cases, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning. So I guess, uh, by and large, I, I, I see the similar situation in other neighboring countries. Thank you, Dar. You're welcome. Yeah, let me continue with Kazakhstan. So uh, in Kazakhstan, from starting from 16th of March, there was a state of emergency for almost two months. So it means that um, our dispute resolution realities were very much corresponding to the decision on, to announce that state. 
So it meant that the courts were mainly deferring or suspending the consideration of not urgent cases, let's say. And we already had online proceedings, uh, the right to have it on, to have online hearings before the COVID times. So during the state of emergency, online proceedings became more and more common in Kazakhstan. As of now, uh, courts are back to normal. However, some courts are still on quarantine because of uh, some judges tested positive there. And um, I, we also know it for the businesses, for the clients, they're still waiting for the results of overall situation uh, because businesses were substantially slowed down. Uh, states supported the COVID force majeure state for the businesses and what else? Internally in the firm, we also know that only urgent cases or cases which started at pre-COVID times, they're still being addressed. And um, as our clients are also suffering from the COVID by, by reshaping their businesses, we do, not, we do know that there is an effect of delayed um, litigation for them as well. This is br briefly where we are now in Kazakhstan, and um, I would pass on next words to Vladislav to hear news from Russia. Vladislav, please. Yes, thank you, Sophia, and thank you, Chris, for the introduction. I have to say that in Russia, uh, this period of time was the time for the creation of very drastic new vocabulary in connection with the COVID situation, because we, we had this non-working days, we have this a uh, strange, strange term that is called high, uh, high level of preparation for the emergency situation, but still not emergency situation. So a lot of things were actually quite, you know, in a strangely political way handled by our authorities. With regards to the courts, I believe that the situation was relatively straightforward and simple. They were all closed in mid-March, except very few cases that the courts were still able to hear. For example, they were still hearing the cases connected with the simplified procedure. They were uh, hearing the cases connected with the interim measures. They were hearing the cases when both parties agreed not to, uh, not to participate in the hearing and you know, relied on the court decision. But otherwise, for almost two months, the courts were closed. And then uh, the Supreme Court recommended to reopen the courts on May 12th. But take into consideration that the overall information about the, uh, about the status of the coronavirus wasn't clear. Most of the courts decided kind of technically to ignore this recommendation. So I would say that till uh, the June uh, 9, uh, most of the courts were not fully operational and only on June 9, they start properly operations. And now they all resume the operations. It's still kind of possible now to go to court and to adhere to your case. But obviously uh, there are two things that were quite important to understand. First of all, in case uh, for example, the time frame for the procedural action was during this, this closing period, then uh, the courts are not automatically extending this period. You have to apply for the extension. And in most of the cases, court are actually agreeing to this uh, restoration of the period. And then the courts also decided that the standard of limitation should not be automatically uh, extended for the same period of time. And what they decided was that okay, they are not automatically extended, but in case you actually can prove that this particular circumstance has limited your ability to, uh, to apply to the court or kind of, you know, to, to act within the procedural timeframes, they will also able to extend the uh, time frame for these actions or for the application. That's probably in the nutshell, but otherwise you are completely right, Sophia. We can talk about it by our, for hours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have Yelena joining us and we want to hear Yelena and Ukrainian news, please. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I would like to express my gratitude for invitation for such event. It is very important because we are living now in a very international world and it is very important to share our experience and truth among us and our clients. Uh, coming back to our issue, I would like to say that we even can't suppose how long our challenging times uh, will be going on from now. But anyway, we have to be ready for any changes. What we can note in Ukraine uh, in connection with the last doings, um, a lot of businessmen are trying to strengthen protection of themselves and their assets. 
And sometimes it leads to big corporate conflicts. And uh, unfortunately, this practice uh, in Ukraine is quite requested now. Of course, we will supervise and assist our clients to structure their business uh, in other jurisdictions. We assist them in our practice, uh, private wealth, to manage uh, education and treatment of members of their family. But today's facts show that no country can guarantee 100% uh, of protection in all spheres of uh, this life. And, uh, this is one of the leading uh, stream in our practice here. Of course, we were also a little bit uncomfortable with court proceedings in the very beginning. Frankly speaking, our court system wasn't uh, ready um, for such challenge. Uh, we still don't have a unified, regulated electronic court. Yes, we have a big database of court decisions, of procedural rulings with full online access. But uh, we understand now that we need clear regulation of uh, online participation in court hearings. Some of judges uh, postponed uh, court hearings. Some of judges, uh, the judges prolong to hear all, all, all cases offline. Some of judges, uh, and even now we use Skype or Zoom instruments, but it seems to me that uh, this is just the result uh, of un un unexpected force majeure situation. As a result of uh, our challenging time, uh, also for dispute resolution practice, a lot of our clients and um, other companies of course, are therefore suffering from expired loans, uh, credits, uh, tough financial pressure from credit, and the opposite. Um, uh, a lot of creditors want to be the first in the loan list of their counterparts. They want to get money back as soon as possible. So this is um, this is a short uh, short summary of uh, what is going on here in Ukraine. Hey, Elena, thank you very much. Seems like we almost all of us are on the same page in terms of businesses and dispute resolution practices and overall court system. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to the second uh, topic of today, which is trends and recent developments in litigation in arbitration in our respective countries. So let me again start, ask um, Ilgar to start. Thank you, Sophia. Um, well, um, what should I say? I, I guess, um, uh, again, we're all representing the countries with the common, uh, very similar uh, uh, judicial system and the common legacy from the, from the Soviet times, more or less. I think uh, maybe Kazakhstan is the only exception. Uh, I, I would do really feel uh, professional jealousy as lawyers uh, in respect of what we are trying to achieve on the Astana uh, Financial Center. Um, it's very impressive. Um, but by and large, um, in Azerbaijan, we have, um, um, you know, we have established very um, solid uh, communication with the government. The government often invites the um, uh, private sector to give feedback on the reforms, on the changes that are required, especially in the judicial system. Uh, and uh, we, we give them feedback in a very open, you know, transparent manner, collect the opinion of, of um, professionals, opinion of, of clients. Um, and one of such events uh, took place uh, last year. And it's very nice to, to see that um, the government actually taking them seriously and uh, implementing some of these reforms. Uh, again, the pace of reforms uh, uh, can be somewhat moderate, maybe not as fast as one would wish, but uh, the, the substance of these reforms uh, is uh, sometimes uh, quite radical, quite revolutionary. Um, for instance, we have uh, introduced um, uh, electronic court system, which basically allows uh, all the litigants to um, uh, submit their documents and evidences online, you know, the complete uh, online document uh, turnover uh, for, for commercial cases. 
and it also uh, distributes the cases among various judges uh, in the same channel chamber, uh, distributes the cases uh, uh, on a random basis, basically automatically distributing the cases. Uh, it also allows to do the you know, audio and video uh, recording of the cases, um, again, to ensure transparency, to ensure that uh, you know, the parties' evidences are properly heard. Um, and then everything else, you know, starting from uh, from payment of the court duties, ending with uh, uh, the notification about the uh, court rulings, you get all of that electronically backed up by SMS system. Uh, so you, as a litigation party, you get all this uh, information uh, in a much uh, seamless manner. Of course, as with everything else, you know, there are some technological glitches here and there, but by and large, the system is operating and they are improving it. At the moment, around 60% of all the courts are covered uh, with this um, novelty, and it really um, improved uh, our court experience dramatically. All right. Um, then also uh, recently the, the government decided to eventually to separate uh, commercial courts from administrative courts. Uh, again, previously we would go to the same chamber for hearing or all kinds of different cases. Now the trend is towards creating more specialized uh, uh, you know, commercial courts and uh, six, uh, they were already created in six regions of Azerbaijan, uh, the big cities and the big regions of the country. Um, there's also, um, there's also, you know, a political will to create even more specialized courts, giving very detailed, very specific cases like, you know, the, the tax uh, courts or cases on, on uh, social payments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which require very narrow, uh, specialized um, uh, expertise. So that process is underway uh, as well. Um, uh, but uh, more importantly, I guess, one uh, significant novelty is the introduction of uh, mediation practice, a mandatory step, a mandatory step in, in uh, employment cases, for instance, in matrimonial cases and some other cases where the parties, before going to court, they will be required to go through um, a mandatory mediation process. Uh, this um, reform was uh, instigated last year with the aim to introduce it live on the 1st of July, basically a, a week from now, more or less. Um, uh, although, because of the COVID, I'm not sure if that will be possible. Uh, again, you have to have technology in place, you have to have a sufficient number of mediators uh, certified to provide the service. So in all likelihood, uh, the introduction on the 1st of July is not going to happen, or maybe if it does, it will happen in small pace. Uh, but by and large, this is where we're heading to. Uh, uh, the idea is to reduce the workload of the judges, to make sure that the parties try to settle their cases uh, out of court in mandatory mediation stage before reaching uh, the court's deck. Um, another uh, significant improvement is uh, the Institute of Private Experts. Uh, in, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this institute in your respective countries. When the court uh, previously used to appoint um, expertise to explore the details of, of the case, and then that the finding of that expertise uh, will by and large inform the decision of the judge. The idea now is to make sure that there is no monopoly on the expertise opinion. Uh, there will be um, private expertise centers and the parties will be free to choose where to go. Um, and these uh, expertise centers are being established as we speak. The number of them already got licensed and, uh, uh, and, and they start operating uh, more or less. Of course, they will be regulated to extent to make sure that um, you know there is no bias and uh, the, the rules of professional ethics are being followed. 
how it happens in practice, we, you know, we, we are yet to see. But the overall trend towards allowing the parties themselves uh, use the expertise and uh, include them in the in the bunch of uh, evidence is is a very positive trend, I believe. Um, so these are um, uh, again uh, the, the, the the major uh, elements of the uh, of the reforms. Uh, there are still more to come. Um, uh, as I said in the beginning, there's a political will in the country that's clearly visible to improve the system. Um, uh, there is, a, if you like, uh, the guiding document uh, which lays out the fundamental principles uh, of these reforms. Uh, things like uh, creating a unified court practices, something that resembles uh, the, the precedent system. When the, the Supreme Court will combine um, opinions of judges on, on similar matters and will enforce them as unified court practices. So things of that nature are, are being discussed at the very highest level, uh, you know, in the, in the framework document issued by the president himself as a, as a decree. Uh, so these things are, uh, are still uh, yet to come. And we really hope they will even further improve uh, the, the litigation in Azerbaijan. Um, I guess that's it uh, briefly about what's going on at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, Nigar. Um, let me continue with Kazakhstan now. And I would say the main trends and developments in our uh, dispute resolution practices or for the last years, several years, they are mainly related to the main focus on increasing the trust and efficiency of our court system and by making less burden on our judges. So our chairman um, of Supreme Court, Mr. Asanov, uh, once uh, he started, um, uh, entered his cabinet, he was very proactive and collaborative with law society in reforming the system. For example, by introducing the change of rules, how judges are being selected and appointed. Also, the civil procedural code is being actively reviewed by amending the, uh, to make it more efficient in terms of how to file the cases, claims, and uh, uh, with regard to hearing procedures as well, to make it uh, less um, ex expensive and uh, to make it in terms of time, to make it less effective as well. So, and several years ago, the separate panel was uh, set to consider the higher profile investment dispute. And it's not only commercial dispute, but also it's uh, for the disputes with the state authorities like tax, environmental, customs cases. They can be now considered in separate investment panel in Astana. Um, so one of the fundamental trends, uh, I would say in Kazakhstan, is that um, uh, Kazakhstan has created AIFC. And AIFC is briefly is a separate geographical area in our capital city. And it was created with its own governor, financial institutions, governing law, and the court and the arbitration. So AIFC court and arbitration are being set in totally different ways comparing to the traditional court system. And um, uh, for the good news is this year and the next year, the cases are being filed with no fees. So it can be very attractive uh, cost-wise. And mm -hmm. what's most important from my point of view and core of this trend is that AFC court and uh, arbitration, they engaged um, very reputable English star judges. So on legislative trends, I would specif specify the drafting of the so-called administrative process procedural code and the constant amendments to the civil, civil procedural code, which aim, as I said to you, to bring more transparency and efficiency to the court proceedings. So this is very briefly it about our trends. And uh, overall, looking back to these reforms, yeah, there are a lot of criticism around and there are a lot of mistakes made on the way to, the, to, to reach the aim. But still, I would say that uh, we uh, feel 
very hopeful that improvements um, they will come real and they will come true and they will really upgrade the court system and justice in Kazakhstan. So this is briefly about Kazakhstan. And next word I would pass uh, to Vladislav, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Sofia. As you can imagine, uh, we were quite busy with the changes of our constitution, so we didn't take, take too much time for the revisions of the court system. However, COVID became a significant influencer towards the uh, situation with the online hearings and video conferencing. I have to say that video conferencing was existing for a long time, but it's quite sophisticated and complicated system. So very few parties were able to do this and you were able to do this only through the authorized center. So from that point, it wasn't really a working system. It was existing only for the very specific cases. Uh, nowadays, 87 of 113 courts in Russia, including the Supreme Court, joined the online hearing system that is much simpler, that requires just, you know, authentication procedure. So you apply for the authentication, you receive special password and then you are able to actually participate in the hearing. That's extremely important, and especially during these days when people are limited with their travels. And uh, still, unfortunately, as you can see, not all of the courts are taking and accepting this. Uh, only in the beginning of this month, uh, the Moscow court finally uh, adopted the new system. So it was also possible to have the, uh, to have the courts hearings through the online hearing system. Uh, that it applies only to the arbitration of commercial courts. If we're talking about courts of general jurisdiction, unfortunately, uh, they point to it's not really developing very well. With regards to the, uh, they do have this online uh, video conferencing, but uh, very few parties are actually using this in the, in the general jurisdiction courts. With regards to the arbitration courts, the situation is of course much simpler and they are much more advanced and starting from the international arbitration courts that are quite widely used in Russia, going to the Moscow Commercial Arbitration Court, uh, arbitration courts on the Russian Chamber of Industry and Commerce and some other local arbitration courts, they quite widely use Zoom and Skype and other online platforms. So from that point of view, they are fully available. I have to say that uh, with regards to the overall system, Russia for quite a significant period of time now does have this so-called online uh, justice uh, system that actually allows very significant amount of cases being uh, on the website. They are fully available from the point of view of the, uh, of the reviewing. Uh, it's possible to see what's the progress status on your case. So this is very uh, convenient and very, I would say, efficient system. And I believe that in case we would be able to add the re reliability of Russian courts, that would be a very efficient system, especially taking into consideration that you know, the timing and the cost of the Russian courts is not very significant. However, unfortunately, we're still having some troubles with the reliability of the Russian courts. At the same time, I have to admit that probably the troubles are mostly connected with the political cases in case you have just a standard uh, commercial, uh, commercial case. In many cases, and you know, for example, Russian uh, legal system applicable, for example, to the corporate issues is now much more sophisticated. So in many cases, when we're seeing the possibility to go to the Russian court, we are not kind of necessarily recommending our clients to go to the international uh, arbitration, but in some cases, we can actually consider this as a proper venue to hold uh, the case and to hear the case. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Vladislav. Um, Yelena, please, can you share with us what are being changed in Ukraine now, what, what you are happy about there? Uh, yes, Ukrainian uh, court system was overloaded uh, several years ago, and we are still in the process of court reforms. Um, uh, today, more or less, um, we have 50% of uh, uh, new uh, judges' corpus. We have now completely new Supreme Court and partially Courts of Appeal instance. And I would like to say that uh, Supreme Court is one of our last achievements and uh, we are like attorneys, we are really uh, proud of this uh, court. These judges uh, came through very hard selection, <clears throat> including professional and anti-corruption. The same situation with high anti-corruption court. 
And I would say that um, this is the first experience in uh, Ukraine when we have a high anti-corruption court. It deals with the legalization of proceeds of crimes, uh, declaration of false information, receipt of uh, illegal benefits and other similar crimes. Um, I can say that two months ago, uh, with European Business Association, uh, we organized the assessment of uh, a trust level of business and lawyers to our court system, so-called um, uh, court index assessment. Uh, this is annual uh, assessment uh, which shows real attitude of business and lawyers to our court system. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, we have um, our brilliant Supreme Court, and on the other hand, we have quite old courts of uh, first instances, instances. And of course, business who firstly face problems um, in the court of first instances are not very satisfied and happy with their work. And uh, as a result, uh, we saw the small decrease of general level to court system comparing with last three years. You will be able uh, to see all the factors starting from corruption and ending the quality of court decision in my presentation, which can be sent after our session. And um, uh, from uh, 2016, if I'm not mistaken, we have uh, one more effective instrument of uh, dispute resolution. Uh, this is administrative procedure. Of course, we, we, we had um, a similar procedure in uh, tax law, uh, but now we have uh, one more brilliant example. It is so-called anti-raiding commission in the Minister of Justice. It deals with unlawful registration of uh, property rights. But it is very important and effective because Ukrainian law connects the moment of appearance of property rights with the moment of its registration. And uh, we are talking about uh, property rights in real estate, uh, on corporate rights, registration of management bodies of the companies, the commission is not estimating the law of the transaction and law interpretation. It is dealing only with the registration procedure. But comparing with the court system, as uh, my colleague Vladislav said that, uh, of course, we always have time for court proceedings. It may take uh, one, two, or even three years. The commission uh, can give a result uh, within 30, 40 days, and uh, there is no uh, state fee for this procedure, and uh, the decision of this commission uh, has to be uh, enforced for in one day. So this is a um, quite interesting experience, and uh, it will be uh, useful. I am ready to share this experience with uh, my colleagues. This is briefly something new in Ukraine. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. Very interesting, especially with this high anti-corruption court of Ukraine. That's really great thing what you started. You started from right angle, let's say. Okay, colleagues, let's go to the next topic. Mm, next slide, please. And what I see now, we have already 40 plus minutes passed for this webinar. And we, have, we are given one hour only. So I would suggest we spend next 10 minutes uh, two minutes each to speak about for our jurisdictions and then we'll leave like 10-12 minutes for the Q&A session. So please let's be precise with the time and I would ask you strongly to keep two minutes uh, agenda. And Irgar, please start. Traditionally, we start with Azerbaijan. Okay, in two minutes, what can I say? I think I, uh, I would rather focus um, on, on weak, very weak, extremely weak arbitration practice that we are having in Azerbaijan, especially among um, domestic uh, litigants, among the two domestic entities. There is still a big uncertainty whether or not uh, two resident companies could go to arbitration, and if they do, whether or not their case will be recognized and enforced in Azerbaijan. So there's a big issue around that. Um, there is also, of course, the exclusive jurisdiction matter, which I believe you also experience in your respective countries, uh, when in a particular case, um, uh, 
can only be heard in uh, domestic courts in Azerbaijan and cannot be uh, brought under arbitration, uh, domestic or international, doesn't matter. Of course, there are some issues associated with recognition and enforcement, but by and large, we are satisfied because we are seeing more than 60% of uh, international cases being recognized and enforced. So the trend is growing, it's getting better and better. And maybe one final word um, uh, about um, a statutory litigation place. Uh, I don't think this is going to change in future. Um, this is probably, you know, what we are, uh, what we have to keep in, in the force going forward. Uh, that doesn't really impact the, the efficiency of the court system. I think in two minutes, um, that's probably it. Okay, thank you very much, Nigal. Uh, as for Kazakhstan, when discussing the uh, question on how parties uh, choose where to arbitrate or litigate or, or place their claims, we have two, let's say, groups of cases. One of them is statutory litigation place where Kazakhstan traditional courts are being exclusive jurisdiction for them. So it's, for example, it's tax cases. They are only can be tax claims against um, actions or acts of the uh, tax state agencies. For example, for them, there is a special procedure and jurisdiction to follow. While Kazakhstan is, um, uh, with some exception from most commercial cases, uh, parties are free to choose governing law and the venue for, for the arbitration. So traditionally, uh, high profile investment cases or projects, they do have arbitration venues like LCIA, ICC, uh, leaving the traditional economic courts to, to consider others. But what we see as a trend, parties more and more choose arbitration in their uh, dispute resolution contract clauses. And what um, cu currently I see some of the clients, they switch to uh, arbitration in AFC, uh, which is very good sign that uh, the, the dispute resolution uh, practice is being developed and parties can choose from traditional court system to arbitration, to local arbitrations or arbitrations like AIC in, at AIFC. So this is generally it and I'm passing the word to Vlad. Vlad, two minutes please, we are lawyers, we can count time. <laughs> can I build 10? <laughs> For two min minutes, yes, <laughs> I can afford maybe. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sophia. So the policy is not really changed, except of course, parties are not able to travel. So they're trying to find the way how it's possible to arbitrate, for example, without traveling to the other places. I have to admit that uh, Russian courts are not very popular still uh, among the Russian uh, parties. So from that point of view, a lot of international cases are going outside. London was popular and still quite popular place. People are considering uh, Hong Kong and um, Singapore and more and more. Uh, other European venues are also still quite popular. However, for example, uh, we have the Vienna International Arbitration Center and uh, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center open in Moscow in 2019. However, I wouldn't say that uh, their actions are extremely popular. So technically people still prefer to go and to uh, arbitrate outside of the country. And, you know, I would say even in most of the cases litigate outside of the country. However, as I've said before, in some of the cases uh, when the counterparty is kind of you know, reasonable and we cannot anticipate any significant negative consequences of litigation in Russia and the legislation itself is quite well developed now. And in addition to this, I have to say that most of the courts are able to handle rather complicated cases. It's quite recommendable to go to the Russian court, at least to consider Russian court for the initial stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Vlad. And Elena, please, floor is yours, screen is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, we don't have something new and special here. We uh, still can uh, choose governing law and uh, courts. Uh, statutory litigation uh, play, plays the main role in our litigation. Uh, we also have international commercial in, uh, arbitration in the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it can be applicable um, uh, in the case uh, with some foreign parties. And uh, we have the law on arbitration courts, but the law on arbitration courts is just a step uh, from Soviet Union. It calls it 
Russian Pretiski Courts, they are not so popular. Um, formally, they are existing. They are not popular because they can, can't guarantee uh, enough level of independence and professional level of judges. And this is uh, why it is very interesting to, uh, to learn more about your experience uh, of such international courts because I know that there is some ideas uh, in our cabinet of ministers and in our parliament uh, to create something similar and to give the parties to choose uh, the governing law and uh, to choose a place of arbitration. Um, uh, politicians are a little bit scared about this because we don't understand uh, who is um, to be able to protect um, client interesting based on English law, for example. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the law of mediation our colleague from Azerbaijan uh, told we don't have mandatory to come through mediation for the court procedure. Uh, we have uh, the draft of our law in the parliament on mediation during several years and I hope that uh, this year will be the final step for this law uh, in order to start this procedure. Thank you very much, Sofia. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you very much, everyone. We could be, we were very functional. It's like a 4.49 and we have 11 minutes for questions and answers. So while we are waiting from the organizers, the questions, let's, uh, let's probably uh, be curious and ask each other. For example, uh, Elena, about high anti-corruption court, is it a special court or it's a panel at the Supreme Court and who can address that? Um, yes, this is a special court. Basically, uh, during last years, um, two special courts appeared uh, in Ukraine. This is a high anti-corruption court with appeal instance and a high intellectual property court. Um, high anti-corruption courts uh, already showed us their effectiveness. And uh, they deal only with uh, criminal and administrative uh, cases concerning corruption, bribery, um, false declarations, uh, and so on. And I would say that um, we all, uh, when we are saying about the level of trust to our court system, and I think we all the, on the same page with the Russia, with <clears throat> any other countries. Uh, all foreign investors are scared of uh, some corruption risks in this system. And we can't uh, say something similar about anti-corruption court because we even uh, didn't hear some, uh, some, some thoughts or some words about this, about anti-corruption court. This is a very, uh, it had a very brilliant start and uh, I hope uh, they will go in on on the same page. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, what about Russia? Vladislav, do you have, for example, the high-profile investment disputes? Uh, they require the additional competence. They require expect expertise from the judge. So if, for example, I have as an investor big tax claim from the tax authorities, like millions or billions of dollars, can I go to special court in Russia or I will go just to traditional court somewhere as per my jurisdiction? No, that's from that point, your Russia is quite, I would say, not just traditional, but I would say very conservative. So cases, again, the state can be actually resolved in most of the cases only uh, in the state courts. So from that point, there is no specific special court created. We have the courts on intellectual property rights, but it's actually dealing only with intellectual property rights. Uh, we don't have anti-corruption courts, so in case we have the case, we'll probably go to Ukraine then. But uh, otherwise, I would say the system uh, is not kind of, you know, uh, diversifying different cases. And of course, for example, we have this kind of case. Which in many cases, some of them at least, you know, uh, I heard, the agreements, if, 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 for example, you are dealing with the state or, for example, private partnership or concession agreement, if you are acting against the state like customs authorities, tax authorities, then you have to go to, to the state, uh, state court. So there is no other chances from that point of view. Okay. Thank you, Vladislav. 
And we have one question from the from our participants. And as I see, it's uh, the question is from Kazakhstan, so it means it is addressed to to you, colleagues. Uh, what are the mechanisms to enforce uh, arbitrational decisions in your countries against governmental or national companies? How many success stories, if you know? The yes, question sir. is how the actually arbitral awards are being enforced. Is there any special procedure or the countries are party to the, to the New York Convention or? I can pick that question if you don't mind, uh, to, at least for Azerbaijan. Um, uh, as I mentioned uh, briefly earlier on, uh, the, the rate of uh, success, the rate of recognition and enforcing foreign arbitral awards, and in fact, even foreign uh, court uh, decisions, uh, is uh, about 60% uh, overall. And the process requires the, the party seeking to enforce approach the Supreme Court of Azerbaijan. Uh, that's the only body who can recognize. And then immediately after recognition, uh, you, you, it goes to enforcement uh, as if it was a, a domestic uh, court decision. Um, uh, there are, of course, uh, certain stories, certain uh, trends that you can see here. For instance, institutional arbitration awards are uh, more likely to be recognized and enforced uh, uh, compared to uh, ad hoc arbitrations. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing is um, when it comes to recognition and enforcement of foreign court decisions, the law requires mutuality. So if Azerbaijan has a, uh, some, some kind of um, you know, intergovernmental treaty on recognition of court decisions, usually uh, it's not a specialized treaty as such. It is like a bilateral investment protection treaty of some sort. So that often acts as a, a, as a test to prove that we have a mutuality here uh, with this particular country so that the judges would be more willing to enforce the decisions of that particular country compared to others. Um, uh, in our own practice, we had both. We had court, uh, foreign court decisions as well as international arbitral awards recognized by the Supreme Court. And uh, it's, it's working. Again, it's not 100%. Um, the law gives the judges uh, the absolute discretion, uh, but also restricts them in certain way. Uh, certain uh, case, if the case is heard in Azerbaijan already, or if the case has commenced in, in Azerbaijan, you cannot bring uh, it under the uh, recognition proceedings. Uh, so there are some, but by and large, it's working, and it's, it's improving. The rate of recognition is growing. Um, can, thank you very much, Irgar. It's uh, we also have kind of the procedure by Supreme Court to go. And uh, what my, my interest is uh, what AAFC will tell here. How, what, do you have any comments, AAFC court or Chris? How do you look at this question, how your decisions will be enforced? Thank you very much, Sophia. And if I may say so, thank you very much to you for moderating this really excellent and uh, hugely important webinar and to our speakers as well for their insights. Um, just by way of quick comment from the AFC Court and Arbitration Centre, um, we have a specific step-by-step -step procedure for enforcement of AFC court orders and judgments, not just in the AFC, but throughout the entire territory of Kazakhstan. And this has been agreed some time ago by our first Chief Justice, Lord Wolfe, former Chief Justice of England and Wales, um, uh, with specifically with the Ministry of Justice in Kazakhstan um, for enforcement against state assets located anywhere within the territory of Kazakhstan state. And secondly, with the private bailiff's chamber uh, in Kazakhstan for enforcement against private assets, again, located anywhere within the territory of Kazakhstan state. Uh, this has been tested so far. Um, and by the way, um, when we have arbitration awards at our separate independent arbitration centre in the AIFC, those can be enforced as orders of the court of the AIFC anywhere within the territory of the entire state of Kazakhstan. Um, this has happened already. We had recently uh, the recognition and enforcement at our AFC court, in other words, a conversion into an order and judgment uh, of an arb interim arbitration award given from our arbitration centre. And that when, once it was converted by a judge of the AFC court, a senior judge of ours, Justice Sir Robin Jacob, and the judgment and order available from the AFC court website, it then went out for immediate enforcement in Kazakhstan with the close supervision of the AFC court registry and my team. And this was very successful. All of the measures 
in that interim arbitration award were very quickly enforced in practice by applying our specific step-by-step -step procedure. We haven't tested the system yet against enforcement of state assets. We hope and expect that will happen soon, but we have every assurance from the government here and the state authorities that we have their full support. And critically, to enforce an arbitration award or court order of the AFC, uh, court and arbitration centre, there's no involvement of any other courts in Kazakhstan. This is direct from our court to the local enforcement agents.